This morning, I'm going to preach on a subject that I don't know if I've ever preached on this subject um, in an entire message. Uh, I think I've done parts of it, but here's the question I want you to think about. Uh, what is a functioning church member? What is a functioning church member? Now, a lot of times, congregations get nervous, members get nervous when the pastor talks about what a church member should be. Because even if we had a conversation right now, there'd be a lot of different things said. And some believe that a church member should be this, 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 this. And others believe a church member should be this, 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 and this. And then to be honest, I believe today that there are many people, they know they should come to church and worship God, but maybe beyond that, they're not sure what they need to do to be a functioning church member. You know, and, and like I said, sometimes people say, well, if you, if you, the, the old uh, Baptist thing was, you, you can't be a member of a Baptist church unless you come three consecutive times. You've ever heard that? Okay. If you missed one in the middle, mm-mm. Now, you know, things like that, you know, we put, and, 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 put, and who's, man put something like that together. You know, we, we put things like that. But what is a functioning church member? Because in our world today, I, you know, we all know we're getting older. But if you look at the different generations that we have, the silent generation or, or what many people call today the builder generation. Um, Daryl, you might be one of those. Born from either 1928 to 1945. Were you born then, Daryl? That is the builder generation, or some call it the silent generation. 84% of that generation believes in Jesus Christ, or are Christians. The baby boomers, those born from 1946 to 64, they estimate about 76% of them are Christians. The generation X is 1965 to 1980. They say about 67% of them are Christians. And then they say, I think this is a little low, but it might be true, 15% of the millennials from 1981 to 1996 are Christians. 15%. Now, that means we're going from Daryl's age <laughs> and we're dropping fast. No, uh, you know, and and Look at the tendencies. Look at the tendencies in churches today. It is harder to get younger people in church. And then when people do come to church, it's kind of like, well, what am I supposed to do? Or there's some, remember, remember our age when we were kids, and if we were not doing what we were supposed to do, our parents gave us a look. Now, it's one thing to get looks from parents, but when the people around you start giving you looks, in other words, son, you need to straighten up, you know, and, and, and those things, I say that because in our life today, what is the most important thing to be a functioning member of the church? I, I asked in the first service this question, some of you are not going to have a clue on what I'm asking, and it's okay. But have, have you ever read the church covenant of this church? Okay. About the same. We had, I think, five in the first service. Many of you are saying, Preacher, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay? That's not necessarily your fault. Okay? Each church has a covenant of the things that we believe in. Now, years ago... Baptist made it easy for you. Because in the old hymnal, the 1956 blue hymnal, to be about 
right? In the back of it was the church covenant that was used as a responsive reading. Remember that? It was a responsive reading. Now, I say all that, not to make you feel uncomfortable, but I think for us to begin thinking about what does it truly, what does it really mean to be a member of a church? Now, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And go down to verse 12. And we're going to read verses 12 through 31. I know it's a little long, but I want you to see what God's Word has for us there, okay? All right. For some reason, my notes are all mixed up. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 12, it says, For just as the body is one and has many parts, all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also in Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It is not for that reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It is not for that reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged each one of us, or each one of the parts in the body, just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, Where would the body be? And as it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that are weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor, and our unrespectable parts are treated with greater respect, which our respectable parts do not need. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable, So that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are the body of Christ. And individual members and individual members of it. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, next miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, leading, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all do miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. Now, as you read that and think about, maybe that scripture is new to you. Maybe you've read that before. Maybe you say, preacher, I'm not really sure about these parts and pieces. But in the church, even in this church, I look at every church is unique. It has Different people that have different talent and abilities. In some churches, we need to see that the church should be helping you realize the gifts that God has given you. Now, I know some of you are thinking, preacher, 
I missed that day, and God didn't give me any gifts because I was out in the rain. False. You were given gifts. And the purpose of the church is to help you find those gifts to use in a Christian way. Now, in a church, every church is different. You know, I was talking with one of the ladies after church this morning, and she was telling about her sister's church, and she said, Preacher, they, they only have 25 people if they're lucky on a Sunday morning, but they come faithfully every week and worship the Lord. She said, the ladies of the church do most of the work because their pastor is 90 years old, and all he's able to do is preach, and he's not able to do anything else. But I believe they have church. Every church is different, right? Every church is different. We have a different makeup here than we maybe somewhere else. But it's still a church. Here, God was describing, or our Lord Paul was describing in 1 Corinthians about the church at Corinth. Now, the church at Corinth was different from other churches, and the church at Corinth, some would say, was a strong church that had a lot of different people, that had a lot of different gifts. But every church needs to see of what God has given us. Now, we also need to realize that membership means we are the necessary parts of the whole. We are part of a membership here at this church, and we are needed to bring the wholeness of this church. Now, also realize that biblical membership versus the culture of membership. There is a culture out there said, well, I've, I've joined this club. I've joined this country club. I've joined this organization. And I don't know if you're aware, but most organizations, country clubs, have requirements or have dues, uh, have different obligations. And even in a church, not that we collect dues, but the definition of membership, if we go back to, to the scripture there in chapter 12 and verse 27, it says, now you are the body of Christ. An individual member of it. And God has appointed these in the church. We are part of that. Now, membership means we are different, but we work together. This week, we have a prime example of church membership. We're going to have people using their gifts of love, patience, kindness, all of those things, working with 150-something children. Now, we need people that have a loving spirit. We need people who, well, you know, some kids come and they're a little unnerved. They don't know everybody around them and, and, and they're having a bad morning. We could just say, well, that child, you know, he, just, he don't know what he's doing. Or someone can go and nurture that child and, and, and encourage that child and before the end of the day, that child is, is happy and excited to be here. You know, in our churches today, it takes many parts. I love where the scripture talks about the eyes and the ears and the feet. We need all of those in the church. Not everybody's an eye. Not everybody is a nose. Not everybody is a foot. But all of them in the church, in the life of the church, is very important. Each part of the body must do its own work. And a lot of times, and, and I think part of it is the church, we haven't helped you find, help you find those gifts that you have. Now, some of you have, and you know you have gifts, but you are undercover. You don't want anybody to find out that you have this gift. Some of you have been doing it really good for the last 30 years. You will not reveal it. We could torture you. You're not going to tell us that that is your gift. Like Miss Brenda, who was church secretary, Pastor Frank, my crystal ball is not working. You know, she said, I just can't tell what to do. You know, but each of us have a part. And we need to do that. And I believe that the body suffers when we fail to do our part. When there's something we can do and we don't do it, the body, the whole, 
fails. Because someone is sitting there and is that man, I probably could do that, but I really don't want them to know. Because if I let them know, they're going to ask me again. And then they might even ask me two times. You know, some of us, we know we have certain gifts. Not that we're bragging, not that we're going, man, I got this gift. I'm, you know. But have you found out what your gifts are? I always use this illustration on cooking spaghetti. Some of you know this. I don't think Vanita would approve. But in cooking spaghetti, to know that it's done, you take some of the spaghetti after you think it's done, and you throw it against the wall. The need of wooden approve. But if it sticks, it's done, right, Larry? It's, it's done. Just make sure you got clean walls, okay? It's done. You know, sometimes we need to allow people in our church to try different gifts. And you know what? If you try to see if that's your gift and it doesn't stick, that's okay. No crime has been done. Because if, it, if it's not, it's going to fall off the wall and then, you know, somebody will pick it up. Maybe that person that has the gift of, of cleaning floors will come by. You know, we're saying we suffer when we're not together using the gifts that God has called us to use. But here's one thing that I, I hope we never forget. Membership means everything. But if we do not do it in love, we've failed. The purpose of the church, yes, is to preach the gospel, to, to, to show what God instructs us to do. But we've got to be reminded also in 1 Corinthians, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not irritable. It does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness. You see, sometimes, church, we have people that come through those doors. Let me tell you, they are rough. They are rough. And you say, oh, preacher, you just don't know. Well, let me tell you something. God already knows. And if they come in those doors, we need to show them a love that only God, yes, God working through us, that we show them that love. And isn't it amazing how God can work and move and, and bring people, not where we think they should be, but where God wants them to be? A church must demonstrate love. We need to be lovable people. But, you know, sometimes... We're having bad days, and we're, we don't want to love nobody. But we need to love. We also need to see that church membership is not a country club membership, where we just come and pay our dues and go on. We need to see that church membership is a functioning membership, where we are functioning within the church, attending every opportunity that we can, to be involved, talking with our friends, getting to know them, Rejoicing with them when things are good and also being with them when things are bad. We need to see the importance to, 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 to realize of, of who we are and what we can do. As verse 27 says, now you are the body of Christ, an individual member of it. We need to be a functioning member, whether we're an eye or an ear or a hand. We need to do what God has called us to do. And if a member suffers, we need to be there to come alongside and to let them know that, that we care. Verse 26 so it says, so if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice in it. Sometimes people say, well, preacher, are you saying... To be a happy church, we're all going to agree on everything. You want to answer that? When it comes to the biblical basis of the Bible, we should agree. Now, on other subjects, we might not agree. But we can love, we can respect we can treat people how Jesus Christ wants us to treat people. And I'm not saying that because something's happened. I'm just saying that we, that we should treat people like Jesus would want us to treat others. 
Are we perfect? No. I always sometimes have people say, Preacher, I'm looking for the perfect church. I used to say, well, then First Baptist is not it. And they look at me. I said, because I don't think you'll find a perfect church. I don't think we'll find that until we're up with our Lord. I said, First Baptist has made its mistakes through the years, like many churches. But hopefully and prayerfully, we have learned from those mistakes. And we see that when we are involved in his church, and whose church is it? His. And we are doing the things he wants us to do, God will bless. I want us to think in the next few weeks about being part of a functioning church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. and Lord, I just ask that you would just guide us. Be with us, Lord. Show us the direction we need to go. And Lord, may we think about our church. What does it mean to be a member? And Lord, honestly, I allow you to lead us, to show us, and to do the things that you've called us to do. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. I will say this.